This short video is from a former volume of Zeteticism, which is not out anymore, which I've redone in a, in a later edition. And this document, this part of the documentary didn't make it back in that series. But I thought it had some interesting points. It talks about what the academics believe makes the sky blue, and that's basically sunlight streaming through the air. And what I discuss is first here is that there's there seems to be a lot of problems with that. I don't know if they try to de they try to reproduce that in the lab, and I don't think they really succeed. So if they don't, it would be just simply a theory that the sky is blue because the sun is streaming through it. And another more empirical explanation would be needed. Furthermore, the academic view, you'll see it right in here, this MIT professor, they always say the sun turns red at sunset. This has really puzzled me because the sun typically doesn't turn red at sunset. It usually stays white. I mean, sometimes it turns red, but that's definitely, from what I can tell, the exception. And it's typically white, maybe yellow, but usually white. So why are all the academics saying the sun turns red? Like, it, that's the only thing that happens, which is clearly not. It's just really baffling. So my point here is, is that there's really some... Uh, it just seems like there's some errors in the academic view. I'm not just saying that because uh, the Zetetic model... The, the Zetetic flat earth view is, is different. Not, not really referring to only, you know, the old Zeteticists in the 1800s. When I use the word zetetic, by the way, I, you know, I'm kind of just referring to the whole movement from them to us, and we're expanding on it now, in the present. But anyways, but more so because there does seem to really be some mistakes. I mean, you'll see this professor say the sun is turns red at sunset. So it's just a little bit baffling. I'm not trying to condescend, really. I, I'm genuinely confused. Um, seems to be a kind of a strange oversight. A little bit. How could how could this be missed? So, but anyways, I, I don't get any of it. Um, but anyway, this first part of the video is about that. But anyway, the reason that this is studied, the well, it's mentioned that the sun turns red, is because scientists such as the one you're about to hear have wanted to explain why we have sunsets, why the sky the sky turns red, and they say. Um, that the sun appears red because we're looking at it through denser air, which scatters the light, and which we'll discuss, and makes it appear red. Because that's the only red. The red light is largely all that's left because everything else has been scattered out of view, to put it crudely. That theory sounds great, but unfortunately... That's the sun is like we just said. The sun's not red, <laughs> so theory doesn't simply is is over. But yeah, we have an MIT professor talking about it. It's just really baffling. I, I don't get it. Anyway, sorry to keep saying that, but I, it's genuinely confusing. How how could this? I mean, just go to Google sunset, and everything's all the sunset pictures are white or yellow. Maybe you'll find one red one if you scroll down. I mean, they're there, but just not many. So anyways. You know, I taught in academia for 13 years, and I saw these kinds of mistakes among academics all the time. In all kinds of fields, physics, philosophy, where I taught, uh, chemistry, history, all over the place. Just people agreed on it. It's like the Coriolis effect. Everybody agrees on it, but who's actually seen it? I'm not saying it's not there. I'm just saying it's hard. It's you know we talk about things and nobody goes and checks, and everybody believes the false is true and the true is false on so many issues. But anyways, um, so what we find though is that I don't know why I don't have any explanation, but I investigated why the sunsets happen and what I discussed later in the video. Is that, well, I don't know why it happens, but when you have a light that shines in darkness, the rays are yellow and red. Go look at street lights. It's the same thing the sun does. The sun starts to go into the darkness as it sets. Darkness from the observer's point of view, because it's farther away, according to the flat earth model. Um, the sphere earth model, they'd say no, because it's uh, lowered on the horizon as the earth is spun, of course. But anyways, it's over there, so and it's shining at us in a dimming sta um, situation, 
And when that happens, whether it's the sun or street lights, the rays turn red. So anyway, you'll see that it's uh, just very fascinating. That seems that phenomenon of light streaming through dimming or darkened uh, landscape from the observer's perspective. That's all that seems to be involved in why sunsets happen, and yet nobody's talking about this. No academics or anything. They've got a completely wrong view, saying the sun turns colors. But it, but it doesn't. And then at the very end, is I think kind of the most interesting part, it just consists of showing how the sky from a plane versus the sky from the ground doesn't show the sky getting darker all the time. I mean, it almost, it almost rarely does. Sometimes it does, but not all the time in any way. The sky is often much lighter from a plane. And this is not what you would expect with the light scattering model of professional academia. So, anyways, on to the clip from my Zetetism series, which did not make it back up after the video it was in was redone. The academic position involves the idea that the sky is blue because sunlight scatters, to put it crudely, bounces around among the particles that compose the sky when it enters from space. And this bouncing changes the nature of light such that the light leads us to experiencing blue in the blue sky. And then they tell us that when the sunset happens, there's more air down there at the base of the earth with the increased density. More scattering leads us to experiencing red. I'm showing you pictures on the screen here from Professor Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winning and world famous physicist. As you can see in his analysis, so in the textbook here you see Professor Feynman move quickly from his theory laid analysis to con to making the move to say what we now have to do is calculate how much light we see and why it is blue. He gives us the mathematics for the scattering and now he's about to explain the experiment on how to do it. Moving to the experiment, Professor Feynman tells us that we mix sulfuric acid with water and then shine light through it and it will lead us to seeing different colors of sky. Let's watch the experiment from this professor from MIT. White light, like sunlight, is composed of all the colors that you see in the rainbow. If I scatter white light of very small particles, then the blue light is scattered more than the red light, and we give that a name in physics, we call that Rayleigh scattering. Professor Feynman and this professor from MIT appear to be both making the same assumption and apparent mistake. Why would we think that a liquid filled with sulfuric acid would have any similarity to the nitrogen-oxygen filled atmosphere of planet Earth? Especially since the sulfuric acid mixture seems to be much more densely filled with particles than our atmosphere is. This alone draws this experiment into serious question, but let's proceed regardless. Rayleigh scattering only happens when the particles of which the white light scatters is smaller than a tenth of a micron. That means a thousand times smaller than the thickness of your hair. So it has to be very, very small. If, it is, if the particles are as large as half a micron, then there is no longer Rayleigh scattering. There is no preferred scattering for the blue light. All colors scatter equally, and so white light scattered of particles that are half a micron or larger remains white. The dependence of 
the power of scattering, so I'll give that P, the power, is proportional when we have Rayleigh scattering. This is the only equation that may bother you. To one over lambda to the fourth, and lambda is the wavelength of light. And I will not bother you to tell you what the wavelength of light is. That may confuse you. But I will tell you that blue light has a wavelength which is about 1.5 times lower than red light. And so if you take 1.5 to the power 4, choose me, yeah, 1.5 to the power 4, you get 5. And that means in Rayleigh scattering, blue light has a five times higher probability to scatter than red light. And I'm going to demonstrate that to you in two complete different ways. The first way that I'm going to do that is to make it completely dark in the lecture hall and have light going straight up here. Then I will light a cigarette and the smoke of a cigarette has particles that are smaller than a tenth of a micron. And so the light that you will see that is scattered of the smoke will be blue. So you have seen in front of your own eyes Rayleigh scattering. Please note that this cigarette smoke is, is an incredibly poor comparison to our atmosphere. Cigarette smoke is so dense that you can't compared to the atmosphere that you often can't see through parts of the gray smoke, whereas our Earth's atmosphere does not resemble that nature at all. So the professor is using the wrong type of materials in all cases here to represent and try to, try to re experimentally reproduce sky conditions. Because the red light more or less goes through. It is really the blue that dominates it that has the highest probability. So we're first going to do that demonstration to show you Rayleigh scattering of cigarette smoke. <laughs> okay. All lights off. All off. All off. So, we all agree that this is white light which is coming up, and you don't see the light here because there is nothing that scatters it in your direction. So you don't see light here, but now look. Those of you who see blue say, yeah. yeah. Those of you who do not see blue say, no. no. You better see an eye doctor. So let's take this first still and compare it to a picture of the sky I took on a family vacation. Take these two portions right here, move them over right next to each other and compare. And it's tough to draw really any sort of a comparison, I, I'm, in my opinion. Probably mainly because it's tough to draw any sort of a comparison due to the fact that the smoke substance is not continuous and the sky is, so it's hard to tell which part portion of the smoke we're supposed to be comparing to the continuous blue of the sky on the right. It's five degrees above the horizon, then the sunlight has to travel through a lot more atmosphere. And so I take here a situation which is extreme, when we have sunrise or sunset, so the sun is there and the light comes from this side and you are standing here, this is not to scale. <laughs> this layer of atmosphere is now so enormously large that more than 99% of all the sunlight on the way to you is scattered away. So what is scattered away, the blue is gone. But if you look at one over lambda to the fourth, the green is gone. All colors are gone. There's only one color which has the largest wavelengths, 
which by the way is 650 nanometers. I wasn't supposed to tell you, but I decided. <laughs> so the only light that makes it through you is red. And so that is the reason why the sun looks red. I'd like to quickly point out what is believed according to this zetetic eye model is the reasons for the sunset's changing of color when it lowers on the horizon. You will note in video footage it doesn't change color in the bottom portions of the horizon where the horizon changes to whiteness or, or a dimmer color, but it changes in a way independent from that. If you look carefully at a sunset, the best analysis is that the sun develops a red aura or corona. In other words, its rays become red while the sun ball itself stays white. Academics tell us that the sun turns red which it typically does not, due to the fact that it's passing through more air and the light is scattered or bounced around, to put it crudely, in such a way to make the appearance of light shift to an experience of red. However, this is not what's going on. If you look at the sun, as we just said, it appears to be, sh to be emanating red rays at sunset. Now one might wonder, why would this be the case? The only answer I have for that, as with the rest of this video, a strictly empirical finding. I have no theory on why this interesting phenomenon happens that I'm about to explain, but it appears it is strongly supported empirically. I first noticed this when I was watching a video with my son about snowstorms, and I noticed that the street lamps in the video remained white while emanating a red aura. And I noticed this was quite standard throughout the rest of the video, and I noticed that it would always be the case that it would happen at dusk or at nighttime. So then I went to Google and I looked up street lights at night, as you're seeing here, and I noticed that typically street lights will also, like the sun does, give rise to a red or yellow corona, or red or yellow rays while remaining itself white, typically, or sometimes yellow, which I thought was a very close match for what the sun is actually doing. And I found that this appears to very closely match what we've talked about so far in the Zetetic Eye model. Because recall, the sun is further away from you when you see it lower below the horizon, to use the terminology of the globe model. So what would appear to be the case is that the sun light traveling from the sun to you is traveling through more darkness, which for some reason unknown to the filmmaker, when light travels through dusk or darkness, it appears to the observer to have a red or yellow corona in apparently the majority of cases. So if the sunlight is shining in a sunset through a darker expanse, it appears that the reason it is doing so is because this is what light does when it travels through the dark. Now if I'm watching the sunset here from Michigan, somebody in Hawaii will see the sun more overhead and they will not see the red rays and red corona because they are not viewing the sun through a dimmer sky as I am from Michigan. They are viewing the sun overhead through a much brighter expanse of sky. In this documentary, the term sky will refer to from anywhere from the surface of the earth all the way to the any of the edges of the sky dome. The term sky typically is meant as an open-ended, gaseous, light-scattering, atmosphere surrounding a spherical globe earth but if we are to keep using the, the term sky in this documentary we'll have to redefine it as i just stated so in summary it would appear to put it in the most simple terms possible in this gigantic room that we are all living in here in the, our sky dome reality the sun travels further away from you so therefore less sunlight illuminates the atmosphere sunlight travels from the sun ball to your eyes through a more darkened expanse under the sky dome, giving rise to the appearance of red light coming out of the sun and illuminating the sky with spectacular color. This is why at sunset time you will often see pink clouds or red clouds on the opposite side of the sky as to where the sun is quote setting unquote. So it appear to be in conflict with the academic view in multiple ways. According to the academic view, if we're seeing light far across the horizon, in any case, such as looking at the Sears Tower from Grandmere, Michigan, 
the light should be scattered and should be reddened, not just for the sun. I was confused as to why academics held only the sunlight would be scattered and not any other light reflected by the sun, such as midday sun off the Sears Tower into one's eyes many miles away in Grandmere, Michigan. And so I have decided that I'm going to create in 26100 a blue sky for you and a red sunset, ready scattering. And so the light that will come to you is blue. And you will see blue light, just like with the smoke. But now, as time goes on, we will get more and more and more and more of those 0.1 micron particles. And so the light that comes out here has no blue in it anymore. It doesn't have any green in it anymore. It's all scattered in your direction, just like here with the sunset. So what color do you think the sun is going to get? It's going to be red. That's why I said I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. So I will add the sulfuric acid. The difficulty with this experiment is always if you put too much sulfuric acid in it, the whole process goes too fast. And if you put too little in it, then you will become impatient. At least MIT students would. <laughs> so I'm going to put this in and stir and then make it immediately dark. And I want you to look at the sky, which is here is the sky. If you sit all the way there, you don't see it so well. But look, how much did you pay for this? These people have a better view. <laughs> <laughs> so just keep looking. For me, it's already beginning to turn a little bluish. We'll just give it a little bit more time. The sun looks just white light as it was before. I always have a backup, you see. If this takes too long, then what I do, I add another teeny weeny little bit of sulfuric acid. To speed up the process a little. I see blue light, and when I look at the sun, it looks a little reddish already. For the physicist among you, light that scatters over an angle of 90 degrees, this light that scatters in this direction, the people who pay the most tonight, who are sitting right here, <laughs> the light is also linearly polarized. That was also the case with the, rogue, with the smoke experiment, but I didn't mention that. But for those of you who are sitting here, I can show you with my polarimeter, when I rotate my polarimeter, that I can the blue sky completely dark, <laughs> and I can the blue sky completely bright again. The people who are sitting there, the angle of scattering is not 90 degrees. So they won't see it so well. But you people see it very well, don't you? 100% polarized. Look at that sun. How many already see why it is that the sun is kind of orange at sunset?
can demonstrate that here in the laboratory. Now you see an image of the sun on the wall over there. Mm -hmm. By adding particles to this tank of water, we can simulate the Earth's atmosphere. For the remainder of this video, I will analyze tests of high altitude flights and weather balloons where I will unfortunately find credibility problems with those videos. I only had time to look at a few in the making of this documentary. I was hoping I would find a few good documentary samples to show what the sky really looked like when you fly high into space without relying on NASA information, but I was not able to. I will also compare pictures of the sky with from the ground with those from a jetliner. You would expect if light scattering is the cause of the blue sky that as the atmosphere significantly thinned, such as when you're on top of a mountain, you have difficulty breathing, and if you're even four times higher than that in a jetliner, you would think that the thin atmosphere would lead to significantly less scattering and the sky would start to turn dark rather than being blue since you're approaching space, according to the Big Bang and heliocentric models. However, as you'll see, there is no such pattern observed, and often pictures from jetliners were brighter than those from the ground.
So I think the point here in all of this is that the academic view doesn't describe why the sky is blue or why sunsets are red. And if that's the case, they have no more credibility or strength than any other theory that is unverifiable about why the sky is blue and sunsets are red. And all of a sudden we realize that what we've been told through our lives from scientists about why the sky is blue and sunsets are red hasn't been hasn't accurately described anything for us and we don't know when you look up into the sky you don't know why from a scientific perspective in terms of science that has been presented to you through your life for why the sky is blue